So I am recording. I was now. just about to. Okay, so I've muted everyone because we shouldn't be talking until Miss Neville calls on us. So please draw this picture in your column that says air pressure slash barometric pressure. A barometer is what we use to measure how much air pressure there is. Okay, so when we're talking about um, the air pressure, remember as the altitude increases within the troposphere, air pressure decreases along with temperature. It gets colder and the air gets lighter or less heavy. So when we're talking about the barometer, it's important for us to know that the barometer measures air slash barometric pressure, and it measures it in millibars, inches, or in HG. No doubt, possibly, when you were on weather.com for the past um, almost two weeks since we've seen each other, when you were in weather.com, um, you saw that the air pressure was measured in inches, okay? We want to make sure we understand, too, that um, when the air pressure is high, that means when this needle is going into the thousands in the thousands 40, um, 1040 range, that means we have fair weather. Fair weather is good weather. Fair weather is good weather. When that needle starts to go over to the other side, as the barometric pressure goes lower, we get poor weather or severe weather. So it's important for us to understand that if it's a nice day outside, the skies are clear, um, you can probably go outside and play. Um, that's probably a high air pressure day. Our air pressure is very high. But if we go in an area where there's lots of thunderstorms, Possibly a tornado is coming. The sky is black. I can hear thunder cracking in the distance. Yeah, the pr air pressure is going down. Low air pressure means poor or severe weather. And high air pressure means fair weather. Here's what you need to have in that column. You need to have drawn a picture of a barometer. Try to label that picture as well with the numbers there. And you also want to write what you see here in red. You do not need to draw this picture. This is a homemade barometer that if you and I were face to face, we would make together. This is a homemade barometer and you do not have to draw this picture in your notes. You just need to draw the black and white picture and write what's in red here in your column, in your notes that says air pressure slash, slash barometric pressure. Please take some time to get that done now. Ms. Neville will continue with instruction in five minutes. I'm gonna let some kids in while you guys are working. Can you guys still see my screen? Good. Okay. Just wanted to be sure. Guys, please keep yourself muted. If you have a question for me, shoot me an email. Thank you. Um, Miss Nell. Yes. Um, he wants to draw the um the one beside the bar. You do. Thomas. You do not need to draw the colorful picture. You just need to draw the picture that's in black and white and you need to write what's in red here. Um, and like on a different page? Nope, you need to draw it in that column. You see it, that chart that we made? 
Yeah. That column that says air pressure and barometric pressure over on the left. Yeah. That's where you write all these things. Okay. Okay. Miss Neville? Yes? I didn't get the um, chart done. I um, I joined at the exact time. And I watched the lesson this morning, so I'm not really sure. Okay, so right now you'll just draw it on your paper. And okay. don't worry about the chart, okay? All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Please mute yourself. Thank you. I can't see your screen. Just give it a second. Miss Novel, you're on mute. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm you. It may be your internet, sweetie. Okay. Um, it'll pop up in a second. If it doesn't pop up, I am recording this lesson. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. Marley, can you tell me what you need? Okay, thank you. Great job, Emma. So can someone tell us Again, what does fair weather mean? Fair weather? Good, good weather. Very good. Fair weather is good weather. Did you have to pay for it? Miss Neville's about to go yeah. on.
So our next weather tool that we're going to be looking at is called the rain gauge. You've probably seen these before, okay? If you would please, if we don't have a place, I don't think we have a place for rainfall on our chart. So just go over onto the, another page and draw a small picture that answers the question. Let's write the question there. How do we measure rainfall? In other words, how much rain? How do we measure rainfall? And the answer is by using the rain gauge. Guys, the rain gauge collects rain data. Rainwater goes into this little cup. It looks like a measuring cup, doesn't it? It goes into that cup and a meteorologist can literally go outside and count how many inches or centimeters of rain one area got based on how much water is in that cup, how much rainwater is in that little cup. You'll need to write down this question. You'll need to write down the job of the um, rain gauge and draw a very simple picture of a small cup with water in it, a water line in it. Oh, score. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, do you want us to join um, the rain gauge up, up there? Yes, ma'am. You can draw a simple picture of it. Miss Neville is about to go on. So as we continue today, the last weather tool that we're going to learn about today is the psychrometer. Now, go back to your chart, go back to your chart, and I want you to look over on the far right side where it says humidity. So whether um, scientists or meteorologists use the psychrometer 
Can you turn on your mics and say that word for me, please? Psychrometer. 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 Yeah. Very good. The psychrometer is what weather scientists or meteorologists use to measure wind uh, um, or to measure humidity or the amount of water or moisture in the air. Okay. OK, so a psychrometer doesn't it look like and you don't have to draw a picture of a psychrometer, guys. That's a little bit tougher. A psychrometer, a very simple psychrometer looks Seriously. like. Open two, Open your mic. Please make sure that you stay muted. A psychrometer looks very much like two thermometers tied together. And essentially, that's what it is at its very simplest. Yes, a psychrometer is um, measures how much water is in the air. And so it's um, old fashioned name is the sling psychrometer. So what we would do is we would turn if you and I were face to face, we would build a sling psychrometer, spin it in the air, and it would be able to tell us how much moisture was in the air in our classroom. So it's a really cool tool for us to be able to use, okay? So the psychrometer measures the amount of water or moisture in the air. You do not have to draw the picture. You just need to write down psychrometer under that chart under the um column that says humidity on your table chart and tell me what the psychrometer does which is in this bullet here Mm hmm. Um, how long are we going to be in the class? Until 144 today. Oh. The entire science time will be with us today because I've not seen you in so long. Miss um, Neville is about to go on. I'm going to admit some kids who've come to class late. Corey, go ahead and unmute yourself and tell us what you need. Cadence, please turn your camera off. I didn't mean to raise my hand. Jonathan, please unmute yourself and tell us what you need. My mom said I wasn't, I didn't have a partner for the little project thing because you need to do it on your own. OK. Cadence, could you unmute yourself and tell us what you need? Tell me to tell you my brother told me to tell you that it cooked him out and that his computer shut down. So he'll need to share a computer with you. OK, you got it. OK, you guys share it with me. Jonathan, your hand is still up. Do you need something else? Thank you. OK, so as we continue our discussion today, we've got to start talking about clouds. Clouds are another indicator that show us um, what's happening in our weather. So when we're talking about clouds, it's important for us to understand that scientists use different types of clouds to tell them two things. One, what kind of weather is coming? And two, or two, what kind of weather are we currently experiencing? So 
I want you to take some time to draw this chart in your notes. Take some time to draw this chart in your notes. Great job, Emma. And if you did not complete this chart during our time away, we're going to get some time to um, complete it today as Miss Neville's going to actually teach you about each of these cloud types. So as a sixth grade scientist, you may have learned about some of these in fourth grade, but as a sixth grade scientist, there are four main types of clouds that you need to know about. The cumulus cloud, the cumulonimbus cloud, the stratus cloud, and the cirrus cloud. These are the four types of clouds we really need to understand. While we're drawing this chart, we're also going to make sure that we can um, draw a picture of each one of these clouds today. And Ms. Neville's going to also tell you what kind of weather is associated with each one of these clouds. When I say associated, I mean what kind of weather will come with each one of these clouds. Take some time to finish drawing this chart if you haven't already. Ms. Neville will go on in three minutes. Miss Neville, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is there a type of cloud called altocumulonimbus? Altocumulus, yes. Okay. Mm Miss Neville. Yes. Um, one of the days we didn't have class. Um, you just, like give us this thing, this link, and the chart to copy down and write. I already have a bunch of stuff in my chart. Great. Like, what. Good. So today you might add something or just follow along with it. Okay, thank you. But some of you, you're welcome. But some of your classmates didn't, sweetie. So I want to make sure that everyone gets it. And if you had any questions, you can get those answers from me. So let's look at some different types of clouds. And I want to talk about their altitude in the sky as well. In other words, how high in the sky or how low in the sky are they? So the cirrus cloud is white and feathery. It almost looks like thin, I always say wispy, W-I-S-P-Y. Wispy clouds high in the sky. When I see a cirrus cloud, I know that fair weather is here or fair weather is coming. Can someone tell me again, what is fair weather? Good weather. Good weather. Yeah. So cirrus yep. clouds tell us that good weather is here to stay. Stratus, please mute yourself. 
Stratus clouds, however, are low. They're lower to the ground. They have a lower altitude and they're a thick blanket of gray cloud, okay? Fog is a type of stratus cloud and your parents drive through fog, okay? So fog is an example of a stratus cloud and they hang lower in the sky. Yes, they are at a lower altitude. The next type of cloud we want to look at today is the cumulus cloud. And that's the cloud that you learned about that's a lot like a, um, everybody thinks of it as a cotton ball. Yes, cumulus clouds are low in the sky as well. And they are fluffy with a white, with a flat bottom. Fluffy with a flat bottom. The bottom of the cloud is flat. Now, a cumulonimbus cloud that word nimbus literally means rain. So a cumulonimbus cloud is going to be fluffy and gray, almost black. And they mean severe weather is coming. A cumulus cloud all by itself is um, a fair weather cloud. OK, it tells us that fair weather is here. But a cumulonimbus cloud it's fluffy with a flat bottom, but it's gray. And it literally means that there is uh, thunderstorms possibly coming, tornadoes, some sort of severe weather. Please finish up this chart if you've not finished. Notice Ms. Neville skipped stratocumulus. You don't need to know about that one. Miss Neville's going on. So we also started to learn about climate zones during our time away from Miss Neville. I showed you a really cool video that if we would have been face to face, we would have watched during our science class. And it told, told us about a climate zone. Your assignment today and for tomorrow will be a Bill Nye video that you'll watch where you're gonna discuss the Earth's climate zones and how they came to be. So as we're working here today, let's look here at our climate zones. This is where you'll need your colored pencils and crayons. This picture of our earth needs to take up a full page. Ms. Neville, I, I already did mine. Great, Good. so you don't have to draw it again. But if you've not drawn this, you need to. Great. Please keep yourself muted, guys. Okay. Hands up, hands up, hands up. Just like Miss Neville. The Earth is separated into three main climate zones. Three. Polar, temperate, tropical. Tropical, temperate, polar. The polar zone is very cold. 
The polar zone is very cold. It's latitude, which you guys did an amazing job on your latitude assignments. It's latitude is farthest away from the equator that separates the northern hemisphere from the southern hemisphere. Corey, please keep yourself muted. OK, then we have our temperate zone. The temperate zone is not too hot, not too cold, just like Goldilocks. It's just right. OK. And then the tropical zone is very, very warm. Let's talk about why. If we're looking at our Earth, it's important for us to know that our Earth is tilted and is constantly spinning. Because our Earth is constantly spinning and because it's tilted on its axis, no, it's not upright like this, it's tilted on its axis, a certain part of our Earth will get more sunlight than other parts of our Earth. So when we think about why, our polar zones are so cold, it's because they are farthest away from direct sunlight and why our equator and tropical zones are so warm, it's because they are constantly getting the most direct sunlight and therefore heat. So our polar zone is very, very cold. Our temperate zone is kind of warm, kind of cold. And our tropical zone, our tropical zone is very hot. And it's all because of, let's write this down. We need to write why. Our polar zone, I wanna make it smaller. Our polar climate zone, is cold and that's because it gets the least amount direct sunlight and heat our tropical zone is very warm because it gets the most direct sunlight and heat. And so then our temperate region, and that's we're going to start talking about why that temperate region is so warm. We're going to talk about that in our next slide. Our temperate region is a mixture of the two. Yes, we're going to talk about how that temperate zone is just right not too hot and not too cold. And to think about that temperate zone, we're going to have to discuss the law of convection. Heat will always rise and cold will always sink. So let's talk about, let's talk about, and this is being recorded if Miss Neville's going too fast for you. So let's talk about why. Why is the temperate zone, that's what we're writing next in our notes, why is the temperate zone not too warm and not too hot. Why is our temperate zone cool? To understand that we have to understand because of the law of convection, the law of convection. Remember it states heat will always rise and cold will always sink. We wanna make sure we understand 
that the law of convection really is describing how heat circulates, how heat circulates, okay? The circulation of heat. Why is that temperate zone cold, cool? And it's because cold water, cold ocean water, and air from the polar region sinking and warmer ocean water and air from the tropical climate zone is rising. This happens through ocean currents and ocean winds. And we're going to look at some pictures of that in a second because that may not be very clear to you right now. And that's okay. This is brand new. They're the crazy ones. Journey, go ahead and unmute yourself and tell me what you need. Okay, I've asked you to turn your camera off. Please don't make me ask you again. Say it again, Journey. I didn't have a question. Okay, your hand was up. Did you need something earlier? Oh, wait, yeah. Um, did you get the... Um, Journey, we'll talk about that later. Yes, I got it. Okay. okay. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. So that temperate zone is cool because of how the air is moving, how our waters are moving. Yes, they're constantly circulating. They're constantly circulating. So let's look at some pictures of that. You should still be able to see my screen if you need to. Ms. Neville spell today. So in our notes, our next thing we're going to look at here today is an ocean current. OK, what kind of ocean currents really do help us to move heat around our Earth? Elijah, your hand is up. Can you unmute yourself and tell us what you need? I can't say anything. I'm sorry, sweetie. It's it's not it maybe your internet connection. Um, I am recording this lesson so that you can watch it later on, okay? Okay. So next in our notes, we're gonna start talking about ocean currents moving heat. Yes, ocean currents 
move heat. So in your notes, all you needed to write there was the title, ocean currents move heat. And we're gonna start talking about what those ocean currents are called. There's an ocean current that carries hot water um, from the tropical region up to the colder parts of our earth. Remember, the um, law of convection says heat rises. So that warm water is going to flow up our earth and it's going to flow from the tropical region to the polar region. When we're talking about those currents, it's important for us to know those ocean currents are called the Gulf Stream Current. And that Gulf Stream current carries warm ocean water from the tropical climate zone to the polar climate zone. And then there's an ocean current um, called the California current, and the California current travels down. Yes, it carries cold water from the polar region down to the tropical region. This is called our California current. And it carries cold ocean water from the polar climate zone to the tropical climate zone. And I don't know if you guys can see my screen anymore. Give me a second. I'm going to make sure. I just want to make sure. Just want to make sure. And maybe if I do this, if I stop sharing my screen and then I share it again, maybe kids like Elijah will be able to see it because sometimes it just gets crazy. Okay. Please take some time to write these notes in your notebook right now. Ms. Neville will continue, and this will actually be our last page of active notes today. Ms. Neville will continue um, in five minutes where we're going to talk about your projects, and I'm going to answer any questions you may have. But first, I want you to make sure you have these notes. Cold. 
Corey, please unmute yourself and tell me what you need. It was about the project. Okay, you want to make sure you get these notes done first, and then we'll talk about the project. Okay. All right, so this is where we'll end our notes today. Now, if you would please take some time, I want you to think about the questions you have about your projects or any missing assignments, um, and we're going to answer those. I'm going to answer those questions one by one. Okay, I'd like for everyone to stay in class while I'm answering these questions. So then um, you might have some of the same questions. It's important for you to know Miss Neville will not repeat her answer.